what's it mean for us in tumultuous times to be a people that's committed to God? This is what Peter's heart is in this letter. How do we live a life of faith in a world of chaos? In a world of difficulty, in a world of pain, loss, grief, frustration, and evil. You see, it can become easy to be disheartened in our world. It can become easy to become disheartened in relationships, whether it be marriage or relationships with children or, or co-workers or friends. It can be easy to lose heart. But Peter's writing to this church that's in difficulty, that's in the midst of chaos, and, 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 and causing them to say, who are we going to be? And last week we talked through 1 Peter chapter 1 and how God's created His church as people with purpose. That there's a reason you're at where you're at when you're at in this time. And it's for God's purpose and for His glory. And today we're asking this question, but who am I meant to be? Who am I meant to be? You see, one of the great plights of Jesus' followers is that we live in this world, but we're not of this world that we're fully in this world in this day and in this time, but yet this world is not our home. We're called to something greater and something more important with our lives. But yet we can be confusing trying to figure out, but who am I supposed to be? See, living as exiles and figuring out who you're supposed to be is nothing new throughout Scripture. Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden because of sin, and sin always separates us from God. It divides us. It's when we choose our own way instead of God's way. Some of the founding faithful fathers of Israel were exiled, whether it be Abraham, who was exiled from his kin in the promised land. Jacob and Joseph spent time as exiles. Moses lived his whole life as an exile. The northern nation of Israel, the ten tribes, were conquered by the Assyrians and scattered throughout the world to lose their identity and to be a conquered people. The southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians' goal was to take them different places and expose them to Babylonian culture and immerse them in it so that they'd become Babylonian and lose their identity as the people of Israel. Jesus was exiled to Egypt as a baby because of threats to kill all the newborn. And believers today, when you give your life to Jesus, it immediately exiles you from the culture that you're in. Because the life God has for you is far different than the world with which we live whether that's here in America or at different places around the world. And chaos can cause us to ask this question, is this how life is supposed to be? And is this who I'm supposed to be? And so today the key question is, who am I meant to be? And we're going to jump into 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. And this passage contains a lot of Old Testament terminology and imagery that we'll unpack as we go throughout this, but I want you to hear the beautiful words of Peter, inspired by God through the Holy Spirit to write this to his church. It says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants desire the pure milk of the word, so that you may grow up into your salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to Him, a living stone, rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in Him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone and a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word and they were destined for this. But you, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What a powerful scripture that Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes to believers in difficult times. He says, I know what the world looks and feels like around you, but here's who you're meant to be. And he gives them three snapshots, and they seem odd and disconnected. It's of a baby, a rock, and a priest. 
Sounds like a bad joke, right? It's a baby, a rock, and a priest. And he gives them these three snapshots that when you look at your life spiritually, you should either see a baby, a rock, or a priest. And this is who you're meant to be. Because it gives these three pictures, and the first picture of this as a baby is you were meant to grow. You were meant to grow. And there's two components that 1 Peter talks about here. The first is this, that which you rid yourself of and that which you take in. That those are the two components to grow. That which you cast off and get rid of out of your life and that which you take in. You see, because if there's things in your life that aren't designed by God, if sin remains, and if we allow things to stay that we know are ungodly, it will inhibit you from growing into the person God wants you to be. It's like your garage. If it's anything like me, it becomes a collection of things you don't need and don't work. And all of a sudden, what's valuable, your car that you paid thousands and thousands of dollars for, sits in the driveway, and the things that are worthless and broken stay in the garage. Isn't that a messed up mindset? We protect the junk and we leave what's valuable out to be exposed. But it's part of our human mentality that comes in spiritually that sometimes we protect the junk, the sin, we don't rid it from our lives and the thing that's valuable we leave out for the enemy to attack. But God's called his people to rid themselves. Sometimes spiritually, we need to order the big dumpster, the one that they bring and leave in your driveway, and just fill it. Just fill it, cast it off, throw it in there, call them, say, pick it up, and never bring it back. And that's what we need to do with the unhealthy, sinful things in our life. Peter's not making any jokes about it. He's saying, we're going to start off. In order to be who God meant you to be, there's some things you need to get rid of. You need to be done with it. You need to be over it. You need to move on from it. You need to give it to Jesus because it was pierced and crucified at the cross, never to be brought up again. So you need to get rid of it. And he says, then there's some things you need to take in. And he says, like a baby, you need to desire the pure spiritual milk of the word. A lot of times we believe that the Bible is just for mature believers. And it is for mature believers, but it's for new believers as well. One of the most beautiful and mind-blowing things is as soon as a baby comes out of the womb, do you know what they want to do? Eat. (laughs) They scream and cry. It's like you in the morning. When you wake up, what do you want to do? Eat. Or drink your coffee. Or get your Red Bull. Like, whatever it takes. For me, it's water. I don't know how I do it, but like water's what I get up in the morning with. And so it's it's like, what do you need? And Peter's saying, without this, Without the pure spiritual milk of the word, you will never grow into who God wants you to be. And that's why we teach the Bible here. We're not just trying to make you feel better. We're not just trying to inspire you. We're going to get into the word. We're going to teach the word because that's the only thing that will nourish your soul. But if this is the only meal you eat this week, you will starve. Or you'll be hangry all week long. And you'll respond to those around you with anger, with bitterness, be short-tempered. But when you're in the Word, and you're daily like, well, when I come to church, I understand it so much better. When I go out to a restaurant, sometimes the food's better too. (laughs) But it doesn't mean I don't eat at home. It doesn't mean that I don't make a meal, even if I'm not as good at making it as a world-renowned chef. But I don't go to a chef every time for a meal. It's too expensive. Takes too much time, and that's not the way I was meant to live life. And same thing with God's word. Here's the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit: what used to confuse you, as you continue walking through it, will God's Spirit will enlighten you. It'll encourage you. And so, start with a devotion. Start with reading a scripture, committing to the Bible plan. In the Life Center app, we have a daily Bible reading plan that can help walk you through that. And if you ever have questions, that's what our team's here with you for. I love it when I get like a Facebook message that says, hey, I was reading my Bible and I just stopped there. I'm like, yes! And like, and I didn't understand. I'm like, it's okay. Let's, let's go on this journey, but let's start with saying, yes, we're people of the word. We desire and crave the pure spiritual milk that's found in the truth in God's word. And so this is part of the, the opportunities we have that you are meant to grow. And we're to rid ourselves from the sinful vices 
that, 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 that throw us off. This is a reminder of their baptism. Water baptism for the believer in that time was an immense declaration that I am throwing off my old self and I'm arising new into new birth. We'll be having water baptisms again in April here. And if you have not been baptized in water yet, I would encourage you, do not wait. There is no good godly reason to wait if you've given your life to him. Well, I'm not ready. For what? To make a public declaration that Jesus has saved you, that he's cleansed you and he's set you up on a new life? It's time. It's this moment. It's now in this season to grow. You see, one of the dangers we have is this, is our desire for the things God has saved us from remains stronger than what he has saved us for. Now we can recognize that God saves people from sin, but many of us fail to recognize what he saved us for. And what he saved you for is far greater than what he saved you from. You see, God doesn't want you just to be saved from sin. He wants you to be saved for his eternal glory and purposes. To find new life in him and to grow up into your salvation. You see, there's something interesting about salvation is that it's an instantaneous work and a continued process. Well, what do you mean? Scripture's clear. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you are saved. It's instantaneous. It's in a moment. Even if you've tried to run your whole life from God, you turn and he's already there waiting for you to repent and respond. But yet once you give your life to Jesus, salvation is not done. It's a continual lifelong process that we grow up into salvation. And that's kind of a different word picture than maybe what you're used to. Peter saying, hey, you are saved, but now you're to grow into your salvation. That there are more things God has for you than the things he saved you from. That there is a life, there is purpose, there is mission, there is something ahead that God has for his people and his church that he saved you for. That heaven is a beautiful place. We're walking with a four-year-old trying to understand what heaven is like. She has got a lot of questions and she's got a lot of answers. And some of the answers aren't right. She was talking to my wife the other day and she's like, I had a dream and I was there with God when he made this and when he made that. We're like, no, you weren't. She's like, yes, I was. I was there when he made the animals. We're like, no, you weren't. You weren't there yet. But God's created you. And, and so part of it is helping to raise her up into knowledge and understanding. And when you give your life to Jesus, which I think is the first and most important decision you'll ever do in your life. And the second is this, that you're continually giving your life to Jesus. That you're growing up into the salvation and life that he has for you. You see, salvation is an experience as well as a process. Salvation is an experience as well as a process. That we experience salvation the moment we give our life to Jesus. And then there's this process of growing up into the life God has for us. And then Peter goes on to say, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you've tasted that the Lord is good. Back in December when I got COVID and I think the worst thing for me about it was I lost my sense of taste. I had to eat things by texture alone for four weeks. It was miserable because your mind tells you what it should taste like, but your experience was different than what your mind tells you it's like. Even my wife, she fed me something one time. My wife's a great cook but it tasted like slugs were in my mouth or it felt like slugs were in my mouth and I threw it up. Do you know what she did? She laughed. She said, you're being dramatic. I'm like, that was terrible. Have some empathy for me. And then the more I said that, the more she laughed. It's a little picture into our beautiful home. But when you taste and see that God is good, when you taste of his grace and of his mercy, of his kindness and his forgiving nature. It causes a response within the believer in the church. Paint it this way. There's a place in western Maui on the road up to, to Lahaina and Kanapali, tucked on the 
away from the ocean. Most people's eyes go to the ocean as you're driving up. But if you tuck your eyes away to the right, inside these banyan trees, there's this little shop that you can drive by and miss it. It's called Leotis. Leotis makes the most wonderful pies in the world. The most incredible. If you ever go to Maui and you don't go to Leotis, I will be angry at you. The banana cream, you have to get it and try it. I've got a picture here for you. It is perfect looking. It is perfect tasting. And when that sweet, sweet love that was poured into that pie hits your taste buds, it changes your life. My wife is not a dessert person. It's usually an argument over whether we should get dessert. We went to Leota's at her bequest almost every day. And here's what happens whenever I find out someone's going to Maui. I am unashamed to tell them about Leotis. Why? Because I've experienced something that was so good that I want others to experience it. You see where I'm going here? If we've tasted that the Lord is good, and if we believe in our hearts that He is truly the best thing we've ever experienced, then our expression and invitation to share the hope with which we have will flow naturally out of our lives. You see, you talk about the things that are important to you. You talk about the things that matter. Yet when it comes to God, sometimes we're hesitant or quiet. But if you've tasted that the Lord is good, if you're growing up into your salvation, the outflow of that will be that we will resound and we will spread this good news of I have experienced the goodness of God, not just what he saved me from, but what he saved me for. And some of you don't feel like you have a testimony because your backstory is a little bit different than someone else's. That's a lie from the enemy. Our backstory leads us to the place where God met us, but our forestory and what's ahead is far greater than what's behind us. And if we only point people to what's behind us, we miss what's ahead, which is what we're saved for. And so you're meant to grow. The second picture we get of here is of rocks. And it's this idea that Peter's given to the church that you're meant to build. It says, as you come to him, a living stone, which means Jesus who is rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God. You yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. And they stumble because they disobey the word and they were destined for this. The snapshot changes here. It goes from a baby needing milk to a stone, a large stone. And we're called to be living stones. You see, for Peter, this testimony uh, and this imagery came from the Old Testament. It came from the temple, Solomon's temple being built and the, and, the, and the beautiful grandeur of it, but also came from his own life. You see, Peter's name was Cephas. And when Jesus encountered him, he changed his name to Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. You see, Peter's identity, his purpose, who he's meant to be, was changed by the words of Jesus. And so out of this change in his own life, this imagery began to cast forth of other people's lives. And I can imagine that when Peter talked about rocks, he got really excited. Because he understood how God had changed his life. And when you understand God has changed your life, sometimes out of your brokenness, sometimes out of your pain, God will birth a ministry. He'll birth a passion for some of the things that you walk through so that others can be set free from it and so that others won't walk that same path. And so as Peter begins to talk about, about rocks, and I can imagine he's writing this, he's like, oh, this is my favorite part. This is who I was, now this is who I am, this is who God's calling me to be. And, and there's this chief cornerstone who, who people rejected, and that's Jesus. But God chose him to build his church and to be the foundation, the sacrifice for which we only have hope. He's like, and now you're called to be a living stone, to continually build your life, to be a spiritual house a spiritual structure, that the most important thing we do when we gather is spiritual things. The most important thing we do with our life is the spiritual things. 
And Jesus was rejected by people, but chosen by God. And we're to offer spiritual sacrifices. This is why it matters when we gather what we bring with us. We don't just show up. We come ready to offer spiritual sacrifices. That's why it's important that we serve together. It's why it's important that we worship together. Can I encourage you? I am so thankful for the work that that Nick and the team put into creating an amazing environment. But what they do is set the atmosphere for us to join in. For us to elevate the, the experience in this place. And no one that's a follower of Jesus is to abstain from praise. I used to think that's not my thing. God didn't gift me with a good voice. He didn't gift me with rhythm in my feet. I faked playing the trombone all through junior high because you could slide the thing and not make any noise. All through junior high, I faked it. Got to high school, they put me in first chair. I got challenged. I wanted to quit in life because for years all I'd been doing was faking it and not making a noise. I was humiliated that day. I've learned that God's not looking for my talent or ability when it comes to worship. He's looking for my heart. And so this morning when Kaylee raised her voice, I tried to go to that pitch with her. My voice cracked. That's why I sit in the front row so I can sing and no one hears me. But I'm going to be a person that commits my life to praise. I may not move with rhythm, but I'm going to move with joy. Because what God has saved me from and what He's saved me for, He's worthy of all praise, all glory, and all honor. And I want to encourage you, you might not say, well, I'm not really the type of person that enjoys this. You probably haven't given it a shot. You probably haven't entered in. And it's not about being you, it's about expressing the fullness of who you are to God. And one of the beautiful things is Scripture says that our praise is a sweet fragrance in His throne room. He doesn't talk about your sound. Thank God, right, for some of us? When I sing, it's not the noise he's here, it's a fragrance in his throne room that is beautiful and pleasing to him. One of my hearts is that we would, I love the atmosphere that's created here, but it's that we all would enter in. We'd all enter in and create an atmosphere that glorifies God, that sings, that shouts, that that whistles, that hollers in appropriate ways of, of his praises. Because we're thankful for where he's brought us from and what he's growing us into. And we bring our spiritual sacrifices. I'm thankful we didn't have to bring goats and cows and chickens in here today. That was the Old Testament. You would have to come with your cattle and they would have to sacrifice them. And now God's asking for your voice? I'm in. Way better idea. Way better plan. And so let's bring our praise in this place. Let's elevate the atmosphere so that when people come in, they may not be able to understand or identify, but they'll sense the presence of God moving through His people as we glorify and lift Him up. Let's be a church that exalts the praises of His people. One of the challenges, though, is is that Jesus, as the cornerstone, will either be what you build your life upon or what you stumble over. You either accept it as truth or you walk away in disobedience And disobedience destination is always destruction. Scripture says here, he set him up as his chief cornerstone. Some will build their lives upon him and others will trip and stumble and walk in disobedience. And these stones, as I did my studies this week, and I was reading some commentaries, my mind was blown. I think sometimes when we think of a cornerstone, we think of like a good cinder block from Home Depot. That is far and away not what Scripture is talking about here. Through archaeology and excavation, they've uncovered some quarries that would have built some of these chief cornerstones that Peter would have been talking about. And one they discovered was 69 feet long by 12 feet wide by 13 feet high. Now that is a rock. That is a rock. And when that rock is set in place, when it's put as the foundation that cannot be moved, that cannot be shaken, and it cannot be destroyed. And so when Peter's painting their imagery to Jesus being the chief cornerstone, he's painting the image to this 69 foot by 12 foot by 13 foot boulder that says, if you build your life on Jesus as living stones, your life will be secure in him. And so we are living stones, building our lives on a firm foundation. And then he closes with the heart of the matter. 
Not only are we meant to grow and not only are we meant to build, but most importantly, you're meant to be His. You are meant to be His. In verse 9 it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the One who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You have received, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse nine, it starts with this phrase, but you, but you, it's incredibly personal. God looks at you and says, I understand the world you live in, but you, I understand your past that got you to the place that you're at today, but you, I understand what's formed you and what's wired you to the day you're at. And you look back and you wonder what the days ahead look like. He says, but you, but you, you see, one of the challenges of living in exile is it's easy to lose your worth. One of the challenges of living in a world full of sin, full of heartbreak, full of addiction, is it's easy to lose your worth. You see, the Babylonians and Assyrians, they tried to spread out the people of God. They tried to exile the Israelites so that they wouldn't be amongst their people, so they wouldn't be amongst their culture, so that they would lose their identity and they would lose their worth in the way God created them. Sin is still trying to do that with God's people and His church. It's trying to separate you from God, get you stuck in your mistakes, cover you with shame so that you won't lift your head to see the beauty of who Jesus is. But God has designed you to build your life and become His. It's incredibly personal. He'll never beat you up over your past. He'll offer you forgiveness and He'll separate your new life as far as the East is from the West. So you no longer have to live with the identity and the brokenness and your shame so you can be found in grace. There are no lost causes in the kingdom of God. There are no people, there's no groups that their hearts are so hard to turn that God can't melt them and turn them towards Him. Some of you have come to Jesus, but yet you struggle to understand who you are now in Christ because your identity has so, been so wrapped up in your past that you can't see clearly towards your future. And you still carry the shame, you still carry the marks and the mistakes of your past into the new life you have with Jesus. And He's looking at you today and saying, but you... But you are my chosen. You are the one that I love. You are the one that I called out of darkness and into light. You were once not a people, but now you are a people. And you're chosen. You're chosen by God. And that's God's loving initiative that he took the first step towards you at the cross. He took every step that was needed besides the last one, which is you just submitting your life to Jesus. And today that opportunity is for you that no matter what your journey to get here today, whether you're with us here or you're online, today's a day where you can make the decision to turn to God, to find new life in Him, and to start afresh, knowing that He'll save you from your past, but He's also saving you for your future. Not only are you chosen, but you're a royal priesthood. The work of the priests were to do the work of God and offer sacrifices in the temple to be a witness to the people and help them understand the word and teachings of God. But he looks at you and says, you're a royal priesthood. See, Jesus came as a servant, took the form of humanity. As a servant, he lived a life here on earth and he was crucified and he was buried in a stone tomb in a hillside and he was laid on a stone bed and a stone was rolled away, was rolled over top and sealed. But he rose, not as a servant, but as a king. And when that stone rolled away and he got up out of that stone grave and off that stone table, he became the chief cornerstone. What the enemy designed to kill him, he set up as the foundation for every person and every believer and anyone who would call on the name of their Lord to build their life. But you... But you are designed to be a royal priesthood built with God and on God. You are designed to be a holy nation. Israel was designed to be set apart from the nations around them. 
to be a witness wherever they were, that they would see God working and moving through them in a land and culture, even when it didn't make sense, but it'd point people that they serve a living God. When Peter's saying, but you are a holy nation, who's he talking to? The church. That God could have chose any way for his glory and message to go forth. But this is the way he chose it for people to gather that wouldn't have things in common, but they would have Jesus in common. And because we have Jesus in common, all our differences get pushed to the side and we gather to glorify his name. The church is to be the most uncommon gathering of people in any community. Our age, our ethnicity, our thought processes, where our backgrounds, because our future is united together. Our past may have had division. Our past may have had heartache. Our past may have had injustices, but our future together, what we're saved for is beautiful. But you, Life Center, but you, Rainier Campus, you are a holy people, a holy nation designed to be in this culture at this time, in this community, at this moment, to declare the glory of God, to declare that he lives in this world and amongst his people. And he closes with this. You're a people for his possession. And this stresses ownership. But you, you're God's. That you're his child. That he's a loving father. And he's a jealous God. And what's that mean? The picture of marriage we have lived out in this world is actually supposed to be an imitation of God's relationship with us. Faithful, committed, devout, loving, enduring. And that's the picture when we say God's a jealous God. He doesn't want just part of you. He wants all of your life. He wants the best aspects of you. He wants your daily commitment. He wants all of your heart, all your emotions, and all your desires. And he'll give you the life he has planned for you. Some of you are worried about making that sacrifice. Can I tell you, there's nothing in this world that will satisfy your soul. It may distract you, it may appease you, and it may give you momentary pleasure, but the things you find in God are eternal and they're glorious and it's what he saved you for. He says you were once not a people, but you, you're now a people. You once lived in darkness, but now you live in light. You once had not received mercy, but you, in this moment, today, can live and receive mercy. So who am I supposed to be? When you take a snapshot of your life, I hope you see either a baby, a rock, or a priest. And Peter's given this imagery because when you look at your life, he wants to see that you want to see that you're growing, that you're building, and that you're his. And that's who you're meant to be. Living as an exile, but you.